Tonight I want to talk to you about uh, communication. Actually, the title of my message is The Seven Commandments of uh, Communication in Marriage. Now listen, I know God gave Moses ten, and he only gave me seven. I'm really not sure why he did that. But uh, maybe because he knew there was no way in the world I would get through 10 of them before 8.30 or so. So he just gave me 7 because he knows me. And so uh, we want to get right into that tonight. And it's uh, the uh, seven commandments of, of communication in marriage. And, you know, communication, uh, if, if communication is not going right in a marriage, the marriage is not going to go right. How many can say, yeah, I believe you're right there. And I think one of the biggest struggles in marriage is learning, learning to communicate. I heard something the other day, and it was in relation to, to communication in marriage, and it, they said this. They said that 70% of all communication that goes on between a husband and a wife is miscommunication. 70%. And I thought, mm, you know, I think that's, that's probably pretty accurate. So 70% of the time, if that statistic is true for individuals in this room who are married, 70% of the time there's a good chance of w what you're communicating to your spouse is being miscommunicated or is being perceived wrong. So therefore, it is vital that we make sure that we as far as priorities concerned in our life and our marriage, that we are working very hard on, on communication. How many has figured out that marriage takes work? It, there's no such thing as cruise control in marriage. Either you're going forward or you're going backwards. There's no such thing as neutral. You're either progressing or you're regressing. And so, uh, so tonight we're going to talk about some ways that we can help our marriage move forward and, and be the marriage that God, God, God's called it to be. Because, you know, I... I, I Give, give you a little, little, um, little uh, history about Sandy and I. Uh, I met Sandy in church. Actually, my aunt called me, and I had just gotten back from Desert Storm. I was in Desert Storm, and, and I'd gotten back, and I was, uh, had relocated in the Shreveport area. So my aunt calls me, Aunt Pam, and she said, um, and you got to know Pam. She's, she's the one in the family that you really don't ever want to tell anything sensitive to because it will spread throughout the family real quick. She can't. You know, she can't really take hints that well, and she, she just, you know, you just have to be pretty sensitive with me. And if she was here, she would say, yes, that's true about me. So she calls me, she said, John, are you interested in dating anybody? So immediately when that, those words come out of her mouth, I'm thinking, you know, obviously she's got somebody in mind, you know. So, so I said, well, you know what, Pam, listen, I'm here in my apartment, I'm by myself, you figure it out. What, what do you think? And, and I said, you know, since you're asking the question, I'm pretty sure you've got somebody, somebody in, in mind. What's your name? And so she said, well, since you asked, her name is Sandy. And uh, I said, well, where do you know her from? She said she goes to, goes, to, goes to church with me. And, of course, the next question being the male, the man, well, is, what does she look like? <laughs> you know, how do you know her? Then let's get right on. Let's get to the nitty-gritty. What does she look like? Well, she's tall. She's got red hair, blue eyes. And, and I thought, hmm, that, you know, that, that sounds pretty interesting. My next thing that came out of my mouth was what time is church started this was a Saturday night so this was divine I know it's Sunday you know next she's going to be at church and so I said what time does service start and she said you know, she told me so the next uh, next day I was there a little early and so I was sitting in the main sanctuary this church had Sunday school when Sunday school was over with I, I saw some doors uh, the door open on this side of the platform and I saw a woman walk across. As a matter of fact, it looked like she floated across the front of that, that, that church. And based on my aunt's description, I thought, this has got to be the woman. This has got to be Sandy. And she walked across the front of the, the, the platform and went on another door. And, and then, I, I, I promise you, I was like, God, if you would just open the door for me to meet her, I would just, I'll do whatever. Just, just, I just want to meet her. So we met, uh, we fell in love, we got married, we have two children today. And I can, I can stand here and say, in all honesty, that second to being born again and accepting Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, my wife is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I love, love being married. And, and so I, I, we have a great marriage. We've had to work on it. We still work on it. And, and, and so I've experienced that, but in pastoring and ministering for all these years, I've seen the other side of it too. I've seen people that are in church, that then they've been married, but they're miserable. And, and they're just going through hell. 
And a lot of the reasons is because they've not taken the time to work on their marriage. They've not taken time to do what we're talking about tonight, and that is to, to work on communication. So, seven commandments of communication. You ready to go? Got your pens? Get ready to go. Here we go. First commandment is this, is that thou shalt cooperate. I'm going a little King James version on you there. Okay. Thou shalt cooperate with God's design. Now, Thou shalt cooperate with God's design. All of the commandments will start with thou shalt. So you can, you know, just be prepared for that. Thou shalt cooperate with God's God's design. All right? Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to watch this video before we proceed any further. Watch this video. You ever been there, done that? You know, you, probably everybody in this room can identify with that. Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem, and here's the reason that like these two actors, we've all had these issues, is that God's design is that he created us different. Do you see him? He was like, uh, sweetheart, let's fix this right now. We, we don't have to go very much further in this conversation. The problem is you've got a nail in your head. And, 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 and she's like, I don't want to talk about the nail. I just want to talk, talk about how I feel. Let's just, don't, I don't want you to solve the problem. I just want to talk about how I feel right now. And I, I remember, you know, my first couple of years of marriage uh, to, to my wife, it, they, were, they were glorious in one sense. They were, they were amazing because it was, you know, started a new journey together. We were walking this thing out together. But yet there was tremendous frustration on my part because I would continually say, go to God. And I would say, God, why doesn't she think like I think? God, why doesn't she see things the way that I see things? And finally, in my brilliant, my, my, my quick mind, after two years of struggling with it, I finally figured out this. I finally figured out that God, she's different than I am. And I know this, morning, this evening you're here and you're going, you mean I came to church just for you to tell me something that I already know that, you know, the one that I'm sitting next to is different than me. But, but yes, that God created us differently. And I finally uh, realized that God created me different than my wife and he did it on purpose. Now, if you're like me, if I were God, I would do some things differently. And if I were God, I would have created my wife to be just like me. But he's much smarter than me, right? He created my wife different than me just like God created your wife different or your husband different than you for a reason. And that is, is that when a husband and a wife, a man and a woman come together and they become a husband and wife, they come together with their differences, created differently. And when they come together, they are a dynamic package. Because it's no longer, you know, a husband has certain ways of seeing things. A wife has certain ways of seeing things. A, a husband has a certain way of communicating and a, a certain way of processing things. A wife has a certain way of processing things. A wife is wired more, a little bit more emotionally. When a husband seems to be a bit more logic. But how many understand that the husband needs a little bit more emotion in his life and the, and the wife needs a little bit more logic in theirs? Are, are you following me? So when a, a husband and wife come together and they begin to cooperate according to God's design, they be, become a tremendous, tremendous threat. And they also begin to experience um, incredible joys of being married to one another. When they quit fighting against the differences. When they quit trying to make the other one like themselves. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me let me share just a couple little sub points there concerning differences. Listen to this. If a husband and wife do not cooperate with God's design and they're, and they're, they're different, here, here's, here's a couple things that'll happen. One spouse will attempt to make their spouse into someone God never intended for them to be. In other words, one spouse... If they don't cooperate with the God's design and accept the fact that their spouse is different, what they'll begin to do is they'll begin to work and they'll begin to try to make that husband or make that wife who they think they should be instead of who God designed them to be. And you know what happens? Here's what happens. There's frustration on both parts. Because one of the spouses will begin to try to, 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 to become that, but they can't. And the other spouse will say, well, you know, I'm trying to make them this way. I'm trying to, to bend them this way, if you will. But they're not bending well, so they become frustrated. And let me tell you something. One of the, one of the greatest frustrations in a marriage is when one or the other, uh, the husband or wife, try, tries or attempts to be something that they're not. 
I want you to listen to this, this scripture. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. This is the amplified version. Now, now, now this is what it means when it train up a child in the way it should go. And in keeping with its individual gift or bent, when he, uh, excuse me, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, we, we, we tell parents all the time, when you're, when you're, when you're raising your child, you, you need to discover the way God bent them. I mean, there's certain tendencies that they're going to have. They're, they're going to be wired a certain way. My brother wrote, wrote a book called Hardwired. And basically, that's what the book is about. That God has bent us a certain way. He's designed us and he's bent us a certain way. And any time, I'll give you an example. Um, one of my bends, and my wife knows this about me. I, I love adventure. I like an adventure. I love a challenge. Give me a challenge, I'm right at home. You give me a risk, I'll take it. Okay, so so if if if, if Sandy came into and if Sandy tried to make me a little more conservative or, or or try to demand that I not be that way, what she's doing is that she is trying she'll be trying to push me and try to bend me against the bend that God made me. Are you following me? And and so everybody is bent a certain way. And so what happens often, I don't know how many times I've sit and talked with couples, how many times I've talked with husbands or wives and, 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 and said, and say, you know, after hearing both sides, you're hearing both parts and saying, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bend them a way that they weren't designed to bend. You're trying to make them to be something that someone that God didn't design for them to be. Are you following me? Because both are frustrated, both are angry, both are just got their backs to one another. And the problem is, they have not cooperated with God's design. Are you following me? You know, there's certain things that, there's certain things that, that just won't change. I don't mean that to discourage you. But there's just certain things that won't change about that person. And you know what? Maybe they're not supposed to. I mean, if they're not ungodly, immoral, you know what I'm saying. But there's certain tendencies that, 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 you know, you don't need to try to change it. Just accept that this, this is, and you know what, listen to me. When you knew that you were supposed to marry that person and God brought you two together, God knew they were bent that way. He bent them. Are you following me? So it didn't catch God off surprise when you, by, by surprise, you know, when he brought you two together, it was by design and he knew both of you were bent a certain way and he wouldn't have brought you together unless he knew you could work together. Are you following me? I wrote this statement down, and, and please listen close to this. You can imitate somebody's faith, but you can't imitate somebody's grace. What happens often is that people will try to imitate the grace or the bend on somebody's life, and you can't do that. You can imitate their faith, but you can't imitate their grace. They're designed and they're beautiful. They're wonderfully and beautifully made by God. They're a custom deal. Amen. Another thing, if we try to fight against God's design, is, is this is what will happen. If we try to fight against it, one spouse will attempt to meet their spouse's needs based on what their needs are. In other words, they will attempt, a husband, if he doesn't realize, if he doesn't embrace that his wife is different than him, then he will begin to, and honestly, he'll begin to do it. His heart is in it. He wants to be a blessing to his wife. He wants to, to help his wife. He wants to be the husband that God's called him to be. And then he'll begin to meet her needs based on what his needs are instead of what her needs really are. And so he's making an honest effort. He's doing his best. I've had this, I don't know how many times with men come to my office and we're talking about this. Pastor, I'm doing everything that I can. I'm doing everything that I know to do. I, I'm, I'm meeting her needs and I'm saying, okay, what are you doing? Tell, tell me what you're doing. And so he begins to list things that he's doing for her. And I'm thinking, I don't think your wife needs that. I think your wife really needs this. And so what happens is, is they become frustrated because they're trying to meet the needs of their wife. A husband's trying to meet the needs of his wife. And, but they're all based on what his needs are. And she's going, you know what, this is just not working for me because I have these needs that, that really God's placed within me. They're not being met. She's frustrated. He's frustrated. And guess what happens? The wall begins to go up. And oftentimes what happens is the men just shut down. They'll just, 
and I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> Why try? You know? There's this uh, couple uh, that came in, came to office. This has been several years ago, and we, 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 we were uh, the senior pastors in, in Laramie, Wyoming. I don't know. Laramie is a university town. I don't know how many weddings we did. I, I, I just lost count. Especially younger couples. You know, I would do a series on, on, on marriage and family and two things would happen. I would start getting appointments because people want to get married and then babies would come along, you know, nine or ten months later. So, you know, it just, I started doing lots of baby dedications after, you know, nine or ten, ten months down the road for married folks. And, um, and so this couple comes in my office and, and, and they said, Pastor John, you know, it was their, it was their, um, it was their, they're getting ready to enter into the, no, they were in their senior year of their, uh, of, of, of college, getting ready to graduate. And they said, Pastor John, we, we want to get married. They've been in the, they've been in our church a while, knew both of them well. And, and they said, uh, we, we want you to, we want you to do the ceremony, do our premarital counseling and do all these different things. And, um, for us and, you know, want you to do the ceremony. And I said, be happy to do that. It was still a ways out. It was still not to really that next May. And so I said, here's what we'll do is we get a little bit closer to the, uh, to the wedding date, about six or eight weeks out, contact my office and, and, and get with my secretary. She'll set up the first counseling appointments and we'll start working on that. And I said, hey, you know, I'm happy for you guys. Looking forward to spending some more time with you. And, you know, I thought they were getting ready to leave. Well, she said, Pastor, before we leave, could you help us with something? And I said, yeah, you know, anything I can do. She said, we've got a little problem, and, you know, maybe you can help us with it. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, um, she said you know, and he's just, he's, he's just, he's a great kid. He's just a great guy. He's just kind of sitting back, and he's not saying a whole lot. And so she said, well, you know, we got engaged not long ago, and, and she had showed me her ring, and so she told me how he had planned it all, and I was really proud of him because he'd really kind of thought the thing through. And, and um, she said, we got engaged on a Tuesday night, and then on Friday afternoon, he calls me and said that he's going to the mountains. He's going to go elk hunting. He was an avid, you know, bow hunter, and again, this was September. This elk season was just rolling, and elk are bugling, and I mean, good stuff was going on in the mountains. And so he, he, he takes off and leaves, and, and, you know, calls, and says, hey, you know, I'll be back on Sunday evening, and, and look, can't, can't wait to, to see you. So he gets back in town on Sunday evening. And um, she's telling the story. Gets back in town. And she says, he calls me and she says, I'm in tears. I'm just crying. And, and so I'm looking at her kind of like, you know, he was probably thinking like, why, why, were you, why were you so upset? And I said, well, help me. Why were you so upset about him going, you know, elk hunting? She said, well, we got engaged on Tuesday night, so I thought that we would spend the weekend planning the wedding, talking about all different things that we were going to do, and kind of our life together, and he just takes off Friday morning or Friday afternoon and goes elk hunting. <laughs> and, and so I'll never forget the look on this guy's face. He's sitting back there, he's kind of slumped down his chair a little bit, and he's got this look on his face like, the pastor's probably fixing to just nail me. I should have known better, you know. And, and so I looked at him and I said, uh, I, I stopped her and I said, hold on a second. And I looked at him and I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I've got this number in my mind. I got this number in my mind and I want you to tell me what that number is. And, and he, so he's got this very confused look on his face and he's, he, he's, he's like, where are you? In his mind, I can tell, where are you going with this? And I said, come on, I got the number right here. It's right here in my mind. Tell me what it is. And, you know, kind of typical male. He wasn't picking up on it real quick. So the third time I said, okay, I got a number right here. Tell me what that number is. And finally he's, he was, you know, said what I needed him to say. Pastor, I can't read your mind. And I said, wow. And I said, did you hear that? I think her name was Amy. I said, Amy, did you hear that? He is not a mind reader. And she said, so I said, what you're saying is you should have, he should have been able to read your mind. And, but what really should have happened is that you should have told him that's what you needed. That would have been good for you. And I knew it was coming when that, those words came out of my mouth. I knew it was coming next. So I was ready. She, was, she loaded up. I was ready. She said, but Pastor John, if I would have told him, he wouldn't have done it because he wanted to do it. But because I wanted him to do it. Now, I'm going to pick up with that story in just a moment. Okay? Tell you the rest of the story. Point here is, classic example. His needs were one thing. Her needs were another. 
But the reason there was an issue is because they weren't communicating. Are you following me? They were different. They had different needs. Now, don't let me forget. I'm going to come and finish that story, okay? So, Pastor Josh, don't let me forget. All right. Thou, second one, second commandment is this. First one is, thou shalt cooperate with God's design. We're different. Cooperate. Move forward with that. The second is this. Thou shalt learn to listen. It's a commandment. Not a suggestion. A commandment. Thou shalt learn to listen. When you hear the word communication, often, what do you think about? Communicate. You think about speaking. The biggest part of communication is not speaking. The biggest part of communication is listening. Listening. James 119, the message. Post this at all intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears and follow up with your tongue and let anger straggle along in the rear. Listen. Listening is required when it comes to communication. Sure, a couple things about listening. Number one is that listening is a discipline. If you're going to be a good listener, you have to discipline yourself to listen. Because naturally, we want to have a tendency to do what? To begin to, to speak. Either to defend ourselves, either to make our point. Something. We, we, want to, we want to get what? We want to get it off our chest. We want to say it. But, but the truth is, is that listening is a discipline. How many knows what discipline means? Discipline means doing something that you really don't want to do. But you know you need to do it. Right now, I'm training for this, this, this big race in, out in Virginia. It's a mountain bike race. It's a 100-mile mountain bike race. It'll, it's going to take me, I'm estimating, about nine and a half hours to, to do it. And so, right now, I'm putting a bunch of hours, you know, training. Long hours on the bicycle training. I don't feel like, I, there are times I, I'm not like, oh, I can't wait to go, you know, ride six and a half hours a day. Because I know it's going to be boring. I know it's going to hurt. I know, you know, I know it's just not going to, it's going to be hot. I know all these things. But here's what I'm doing. I'm disciplining myself to do something because I know there's great benefit in it. That's what discipline is. When you discipline yourself to listen, you do it because there's going to be great benefit in it. And what is that benefit? Benefit is, is that you're learning something about your spouse. You're learning something about them. Are you following me? Now, which leads to the next one. Listen leads to learning. All right, the couple. Let's go back to the couple. Listening leads to uh, listening to discipline. Listen leads to learning. Let's go back to the couple real quick. Now, what did she say? She said, if I have to tell him, then he won't do it because he wants to. He'll, out of his heart, he'll do it because I want him to do it. Right? I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'll bet you, <laughs> if I were a betting man, that there are several people in this room that would have gone, mm, yeah, I've done that one. Okay, either way. Here's how it works. So I began to explain it to her this way. I said, Here, here's the deal. When, when you share something of your heart with him, like your desire, your need, when you share that, that's like a seed, and you're handing it to him. So he can do one of two things with that seed, that knowledge about you. He can do one of two things. He can take that, and even though it may be different than the way he feels, it may be different than what he needs, he'll take that into his heart, and guess what it will sprout up as? Guess what it will give birth to? A desire. So he's not doing it because he has to. He's not doing it simply because you feel like he feels like you know, you want him to do that. He's doing it because he wants to. But he can't do that unless you give him the seed. And when it comes to listening, if we're not willing to listen, the seeds that our spouse gives us will fall to the floor. So here's what I challenge you to do, men 
and ladies, husbands and wives. When you listen, listen to learn. Not, don't listen selfishly. You know what I mean by listening selfishly? Here's what I mean by that. Don't listen. Listening is, is like going, you're not even listening. You're just waiting for them to stop talking so you can make your point. <laughs> no, no, listening, listening has to be selfless. It can't be selfish. Selfless listening is, I'm, I want to learn you. I want to learn something new about you. I want to, I want to get what you've, what you've got. Another three, and this is, this is, this happened not too far from here, as a matter of fact. Another, this is an important thing about listening. And I learned this one, I learned this one through this story. I tell lots of stories, but several years ago, let me put it this way. I, I'm convinced of this for a husband and wife. God will not always speak directly to you when you're married. I believe that God will speak through your husband or your wife to talk to you. I believe that. Several years ago, we were preparing to go to Romania. And um, I was invited to speak in a church over in Texas. That for me, it was a tremendous honor to speak in this man's church. And so we were, we had, we came through uh, Alexandria. We came, we were down in this area. So we were heading actually down this highway. And we had, the girls were little, like two and three, I think, three, four, something like that. And so we had this Dodge Caravan. And um, to tell you the your model of it, it still had a distributor cap on it. All right. So we, 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 uh, I had just had it all tuned up because I didn't want anything to go wrong. I wanted to get there. I want everything to go right. It's important to, to be there at this church. And so, um, so we're going along and, and, you know, it was about this time of the year and we had, we went through a a, a thunderstorm just a little bit west of here. And so we hit this water in the road and the van began to miss real bad. I mean, just really bad. And so to give you a little bit of background about my wife, my wife then and pretty much now, she knows how to put gas in the car. She knows how to start the car, drive it. That's about it. Okay. So we're driving along, the car begins to, the, the van begins to miss really bad. I mean, it's just spitting and sputtering, wouldn't hardly go. So I pull over to the side of the road and just sit there a minute. Of course, in my, this was on a Saturday. We had to be there by Saturday evening to preach on Sunday morning. So my mind begins to, just, it's spinning. It's going, oh my gosh, we got to get there. What's wrong with this van? I just had it tuned up. So I got out, opened the hood, and I'm fairly mechanically inclined. I looked at everything. I didn't see anything, you know, was obviously wrong. I, I just, I just didn't see anything. Closed the hood, got back in, and my wife said, she said, John, what about the distributor cap? And I said, Sandy, with all the peace I could muster up, Sandy, sweetheart, sweetheart, it's not the distributor cap. I just had all of that replaced. I just had it tuned up. I just had it all replaced. It's not the distributor cap. With a faith smile on my face. Okay. So I started back up. It ran fine. I was like, bless. We prayed. I said, bless Hallelujah, it's a miracle. So we start driving again, went through another downpour, same thing happened. We went a little ways, and so long story short, it was, it was probably a little after noon, we hit over close to Leesville. And, uh, and it happened one more time, and Sandy could tell I was getting a little frustrated, so she was a little more tentative in saying, sweetheart, if you just look at the distributor cap. What do you think about the distributor cap? And finally I said, sweetheart, I I don't even think you know what the distributor cap is. <laughs> and she said, I know, honey, I know, but this, I just, and so we, there was an auto zone. Everything else was closed. There was an auto zone. So I pulled in there and honestly, when I pulled in there, I thought I'm going to open the hood and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to look at the distributor cap because I know it's not it, but she will not say another word about the distributor cap. So there's a coil wire going from the distributor cap to the coil. So I pulled, the in, the, pulled it off and I looked on the distributor cap in. Inside the, the little where the coil wire goes in the top of the distributor cap, there was a white powder. And I went, that doesn't look right. Now what did I take that off of? The distributor cap. 
So I walked inside and I held up this, this wire to the guy in the auto zone. And I said, I'm having this problem with the vehicle. Could this be it? And he looked at it and said, yeah, this is a defective filament. And I said, it's new. He said, ah, it's manufactured defect here. $5 part, went out, put it back on, ran fine. So I get back in the van and I'm driving and there's silence in the van. And um, my wife, you, you, you just got to know her. She is so gracious. She is such a gracious woman. And I knew she wasn't going to bring up anything. She wasn't going to say it. And I said, but I, so I went ahead and it was the man. Swallowed my pride. And I said, um, sweetheart, it had something to, something to do with the distributor cap. <laughs> and her face, I'll never forget the expression of her face. She said, John, that had to have been God. That was the Holy Spirit. Because I don't even know. You, you said it earlier and you were right. I don't know anything about the distributor cap. I just kept getting in my heart, in my mind, distributor cap, distributor cap, distributor cap. And, and so she said, I felt like I had to say it. I know you were getting upset. She said, you know, just trying to explain everything. And I'm going, I got it. I know. I mean, it was, it was a no-brainer. It was God. So we laughed about it. We just kind of thanked God for it. And then I'm riding. It was, you know, it was quiet again. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, that's not the first time that I've spoke to you through her and you didn't listen. He said, I said other things to her and you didn't listen to her because you thought it was just her wisdom, but it was really mine. And it happened. Oh, I mean, I felt just, it just crushed me. Because I, I, I had, I had, she had said things before when we we're praying to think about things. And you know what? I had to be the man. I had to be the guy that made, made the call. But I realized right then that God, and I began to think back in, I bet it was this time, and I bet it was this time, and I bet it was this time when God was talking to me through my wife, and I wouldn't listen to her. The reason it's important to listen, thou shalt learn to listen, is because God might not always tell you something directly, but he'll speak something to your spouse and you need to learn to listen. Can I have a better amen than that big one that I just got? Since that point, there have been times where we, life decisions and things like that, I'll say, sweetheart, what do, you, what do you think? Talk to me, let's talk about this. And she'll start talking. And there, there have been several times. I know that she didn't have any in-depth knowledge about, you know, this particular thing. But boy, she would, she would say something. And it goes back the other way. Ladies, it goes back the other way too. I have seen it happen many times, pastoring, where a, a woman of God had been praying for her husband and her husband got saved and, and began to serve God and began to speak words of wisdom and she wouldn't listen to him because she didn't feel like that he was mature enough. But I knew it was God talking. She just wouldn't listen. Thou shalt learn to what? Listen. Be, uh, the King James Version says be quick to what? Be slow to speak and be quick to listen, to hear. That's right. All right, number three. I got to get to moving and get moving here. Thou shalt fight fairly. I'm not talking about fight in the sense of throwing pots and pans and screaming and hollering at each other. I'm talking about just reserve, uh, you know, re uh, 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 resolving conflicts, in, in, in which are inevitable. I was, I was talking to a couple not long ago. They were a fairly new married, newly married couple, probably about a year. And they came in and they said, Pastor John, we think something's wrong with us. And I said, well, what is it? And, and they started sharing and, you know, about some, you know, conflicts over stupid stuff. Like, one didn't like the other one squeezing the toothpaste from the bottom. They did it from the middle or, or whatever. You know, it's just crazy things like that. And so they were going on and on and on. And you could tell they were, they were concerned because they thought they were a special case. And I said, listen, <laughs> you guys are normal. You're normal. It's okay. Those things are normal. You're learning each other. But just don't let these issues turn in, these little things turn into big issues. Okay, just, just, just don't go there. So you, you just got to learn how to, to resolve these things is what I'm, here's, here's some things that you can do. So I gave them, I gave them some, I gave them some, um, I gave them some, some tools to work with and I believe they're going to be fine. But, but conflicts are inevitable. But here's, here's where I'm going to start with this tonight. This is a statement and listen closely. Never pick a battle 
where there are no spoils. Never pick a battle where there are no spoils. Here's where I get that statement from. How many remember David and Goliath? Remember that? How many saw the, um, the series, the Bible, not, you know, it was several months ago. You know, I watched it, most of it. And it was pretty accurate. I thought it was pretty good. The only thing that just really got me, really bothered me, was David going out to fight Goliath. I thought David, they portrayed David as a little bit wimpy. I don't throw stones at me for saying that. But, I mean, he's just kind of wimpy. I mean, he, I, I expected when it came to that point where David went out and fought Goliath that, that they were going to show David talking trash to Goliath. Because he did. And the truth was, Goliath that day was not the one that picked the fight. David did. David's the one that picked the fight. And I've often heard it said that David picked the fight because of what Saul had said concerning the reward for the man who killed Goliath. You get the daughter, you're tax-free, and in his kingdom for the rest of his life, instant royalty, instant wealth, no taxes. I've heard that communicated on more than one occasion as to the reason that David went out and picked the fight. That's not true. That's not the reason David went out and picked the fight. David... Uh, told Goliath, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to take you down today. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to feed you to the fowls of the air. And he said, the reason that I'm going to do that is so that all of the world will know that there's a God in Israel. That's the reason that he said that. He picked that fight because the spoils were not selfish. The spoils were selfless. It was something good that was going to come out of that that just benefited other people and not just himself. Are you following me? That's the reason I got this, the statement, never pick a battle where there are no spoils. Listen very closely. Couples often engage in conflict for all the wrong reasons. Here's, here's a few. They want to be right. <laughs> and you know, for the most part, who doesn't? I mean, whoever gets up, who, who gets up in the morning and goes, I just hope I'm wrong today. I don't know anybody that goes, oh, I just, I just make my day if I was just completely wrong like three or four times in a row. No, nobody gets it. Mean, people just feel good about being right. But you know, being right and having to be right is not really a spoil. Sometimes what about hurt or revenge? Sometimes people engage in a conflict because they're, they're hurt and they want revenge. I'm hurt, so I want to hurt you. That's not a spoil. So they pick the battle because they want to win. They pick the battle because they're hurting and they want to hurt their spouse. Not a spoil. Or maybe they're insecure and they're responding out of that insecurity. They pick a battle because they've got this security and they want to put a wall up. Because they don't want anybody to see that. They don't want their spouse to see that insecure, that unsecured place in their life. Or maybe they just want to plain old get their way. And that's not a spoil. Let me, let me share one, one thing. I could go a thousand different directions here, but when I was praying, I really felt strongly to go this direction. When you fight fairly and when you pick a battle where there's some good things that are going to come that don't just benefit you, it benefits the marriage. Here's something that you got to do. You can't go here. Do not bring up the past. Do not, do not, do not bring up the past. Real quick, John chapter 9. Jesus is walking along with his disciples and the disciples look over and there's a blind guy. Remember this? Blind guy. And the disciples looked at the blind guy and they said, Jesus, why is he blind? Was it because of something that he did? Was it a sin in his life or was it the sin of his parents? Whose fault is that? Why is he the way that he is? And you know what Jesus did? Jesus didn't go there with him. He went on to heal the guy. Remember, he's, you know, he's, he spat on the ground, made the mud. I, I've said this before. I believe that's evidence that Jesus was a redneck. I mean, he just spit. He could have done a lot of things, but he just spit. If you notice, he did that several times in the scriptures. He spit, and one guy touched his tongue. With, I'm, you know, that's redneck. You spit. That's what we do. We like to spit. We see how far we can spit as kids, and we just, we like to spit. 
I grew up a redneck. I'm, 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 I wouldn't even say reformed redneck. I still like to spit every once in a while just because it feels good. But anyway, so Jesus healed the guy, right? Put the mud on his eye, said, go wash in the pool, slum, and come back. And the guy could see again. I was reading that not long ago, and I thought, you know, the greatest, what Jesus didn't do was just as powerful as what he did do. Jesus didn't get on the blame train with the disciples. Jesus could care less about the past in that man's life. He could care less. You know why? Jesus couldn't do anything about his past. He couldn't make what had happened for whatever reason. He couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't go back and undo that. So Jesus didn't, didn't even go there. Jesus was concerned about what he could do in that moment and what this man's future was going to be like. That's what, that's, what, that's what his focus was on. So he didn't get on the blame train with the disciples. Matter of fact, the message, the message uh, paraphrase says, you're asking the wrong question. You're, you're on the wrong page, guys. This is not about the guy's past. It's about what I can do right here, right now for this guy. You see, what happens is, is when, we, when we fight unfairly in a marriage, we, we, we bring the past up, and that is completely unfair. It's, it's not even, it's, what's the other one supposed to do about that? They, 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 can't, un, they can't undo it. And I want you to listen to me tonight. If your spouse has hurt you by something in the past, I'll bet you anything that they have wished a million times over that they could go back and not do what they did. I'll, I'll bet you. But how many times when we, when we get in a conflict do we immediately get that arrow out? It's the arrow of the past and say, I'm fixing to let this one go because I'm hurt. They hurt me. Well, you remember when you did this, or you remember when you did that. And then it, here we go, back and forth. Nothing good, there are no spoils in that. Nothing good will ever come from bringing up the past. Put your hand on your heart and say, I will not bring up the past in Jesus' name. It's not fair. You're not fighting fairly. And because they can't do anything about it. Aren't you glad you came to church on a Wednesday night? I, I am just, this just, wow. Number four, thou shalt detox your heart. Thou shalt detox your heart. Proverbs 20, uh, 4, 23. And we're moving pretty quickly here. It says, keep a vigilant. Everybody say vigilant. Keep a vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. Very familiar verse of scripture. Listen, how many of you know that toxic words come from a toxic heart? Have you been around people who their words are just toxic? I mean, they're just corrosive and they're just, man, they're just, well, it's, it's because their heart's toxic. So how many know what it means to detoxify something? It means to get the toxins out of it. I, I, I almost didn't share this, but I'm going to share it just for the sake of you remembering this point, okay? Pastor Josh is probably going, oh my gosh, what is he going to say? My wife's probably going to shoot me for this. But I do shave my legs. <laughs> She's going to kill me. But here's why. I cycle. I race, Okay. And so, I, I, you know, I, I shaved my legs. As a matter of fact, it was so funny. Not long ago, we were laying in bed. And she said, John, you need to shave your legs. And so I just started laughing. I said, Sandy, when you were dreaming about your husband and things that you would say, did you ever imagine that you would say, honey, please shave your legs? Did, did you ever imagine that? She said, no, it never entered in my imagination. The reason, and people go, I ask that question a lot of times, well, why do, you, why do you shave your legs? One of the reasons to shave your legs is because when you, when you cycle a lot, you, you have what's called lactic acid that builds up in your legs. And it's, it's, it's I'm not going into the details of it, but it basically, 
uh, builds up and it sits in your muscles. And the way you get that out is through massages. You massage and you rub them. That's the reason these guys and the pros, you see them, and they get massages all the time because it helps, gets the knots out, and then it also helps get the toxins out. And so, so when you see a cyclist and their legs are shaved, you go, I know why they shave their legs. It's to get the to- help get those to- to get the, the lactic acid and get the, the toxins out of there. Because if you leave it there, your muscles won't work right. If you allow your heart and toxins to remain in your heart, your life won't work right. Because your words will always be what? Toxic. You say, Pastor John, how do you, how do you know your words are toxic? My words are toxic. How do, how do you know that? You listen to yourself. And if you're not sure, you ask your spouse, hey, how are my words? How how am I doing in the words department? We all heard this. Words can give life or words can give what? Death. And some of you look at me like, I'll never look at that guy the same. He shaves his legs. I don't know if I'm just, I just, I probably just lost you right there. I mean, eventually the Holy Spirit will make it back and around and (laughs) hallelujah. Um. Number five, very important. Thou shalt ask the right questions. Thou shalt ask the right questions. Have you ever noticed when you read the scriptures that Jesus asked people questions? You ever, you ever notice that? You know why? You know why he did that? He asked people questions for the sake of discovery. Sake of discovery. Jesus knew that man, God created us to live from the inside out. And so he would ask people questions because the nature of the question, if you're going to answer a question, you have to look on the inside to do it. You're going to answer that question. I mean, if I ask, if you ask me a question, John, what, what's your favorite color? I have to look on the inside, but I don't have to look very far because that's a pretty easy question to answer. I like blue. If you ask me, John, why do you get defensive when you get in this situation? Guess what I have to do? I have to look where? Inside a little further to answer that question. I might have to look a little further, work a little harder to discover what it is. But I'm, I'm going to discover it and I'm going to give you the answer back. It's the reason Jesus asked people questions. Jesus asked the, the disciples one day, who do people say that I am? What did Peter do? Peter discovered who he was. Another reason Jesus did is because Jesus wanted to discover how he could meet them where they were. And so questions are powerful. Several years ago, I was sitting by, um, I was, we were at a wedding rehearsal, getting ready to do a wedding. So we're at the wedding rehearsal and I saw this little couple. Um, they were towards the back when we were doing the, doing the rehearsal at the church. And I thought, man, that's just a cool looking couple. I mean, they were holding hands. They were, you tell they've been married a while and, and they were just awesome. Look. I mean, they just, they, they were just, they were just happy. At the reception dinner, just so happened, I'm sitting by this guy. She's on the other side, Sandy's on this side. Come to find out, it was the grandfather of the groom. So we're sitting there, and I said, hey, I, my name's John. Obviously, you know, you know I'm going to be doing the wedding. You saw me at the, at the church. And so we're talking, and I said, how long have you guys been married? And they said, uh, he said, well, I've been married 53 years. I said, man, that is awesome, 53 years. And so I said, um, so I said oh, just kind of off the cuff. I said, you probably got it all figured out by now, huh? And, and he said, and I'll never forget this answer. He said, no, nope, I'm still learning things about her. I said, wait a second. After 53 years, you're still learning things about your wife. You'd think, you know, I thought you'd have her all figured out. You know, about 40, you'd got them all figured out. And he said, oh, no, no. He said, here's the reason why. When he said it, and the words came out, it made all sense in the world. He said, he said, he said John, our pastor, he said, you know, we're, we're, but we both love God. We both love Jesus. And he said, because of that, we're both changing. We change all the time. We're, we're constantly changing. So because we're changing, there are things that I need to, I, I, I know now that there are things available for me to discover about my wife and things for her to discover about me. 53 years they've been married. You know what I did with that nugget? I took that one and I placed it here and here and I said, I will not forget that one. And he said, as a matter of fact, there are three questions that we started asking each other years ago and we said, we still ask these three questions. And I was like, okay, when he tells me these questions, I will not forget them. And here's, here's the three questions. My wife and I began to do this. He said, we ask each other periodically. He said, we may go out together when we're alone and, and talking, and we'll ask each other these three questions. 
How can I be a better friend? How can I be a better lover? And, and he says, I'll ask her, how can I be a better husband? Wives, you say, how can I be a better wife? Those three questions. And he said, we begin to talk. And he said, what I do is I begin to discover things with those questions. I began to discover things about my wife that I didn't know because she's changed. What are the three questions? How can I be a better friend to you? How can I be a better lover to you? And how can I be a better husband or wife to you? You see, that, that's how we learn each other. We ask each other. And we got to be honest. Amen? We got to be honest. I challenge you. I challenge you, husbands and wives. You start asking each other those questions. Not every day. <laughs> but make it a real special time and go out and just wherever and say, I, I want to ask you this. And you will be amazed at things that you learn about your husband and your wife. Amen? Amen. Number six, thou shalt love peace. The older I get, the more I love peace. I just love it. I'm addicted to peace. If you love peace, you'll make peace. Please listen here. One of the greatest gifts that you can give your husband or wife give each other is a commitment to have peace in your marriage we are committed to peace in our marriage that is non-negotiable whatever happens whatever takes place we will have peace if you're a parent listen to me parents one of the greatest gifts you can give your children is peace in your marriage one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids or peace in your marriage I, I've got one, we got two girls. They're a junior, a sophomore and junior in college now. And talking with them, they're old enough, we, we, you know, we talk and we you know, reminisce and things like that. Sandy and I have been amazed at how perceptive they were at an early age. Things going on, maybe struggles that Sandy and I might have been having or maybe struggling, th things that Sandy were, and I were struggling together in. Maybe financial challenges. And we, we just, we were, we just been amazed by it. My point is, is that your kids pick up on so much more than you think that they do. Right. You think you're hiding some things, you're trying to get, no, no, no. They pick up on a lot more than you think. And they know if something's not, I, I know right now, I've got, I've got a couple right now that, that, that their kids, they're having issues in their marriage and their kids are tormented because they are scared to death that their mom and dad are going to get a divorce. Nobody's ever said a word about divorce, but they have perceived it and, and they're being tortured by it. The greatest gift, parents, you can give your parents is peace in your marriage and peace in your home. Great. You can buy them a car, give a million bucks. Nothing is greater than that peace. Nothing. Listen to this very closely. Peace does not happen when two people get what they want. No, peace doesn't happen when two people get what they want. That's selfishness. I get what I want, you get what you want, we got peace. No, peace happens when two people want what God wants. That's when peace happens. Two selfish people can never have peace. Never. Now, the last commandment will destroy selfishness, which will help you have peace. And that is, thou shalt love as if your life depends on it. Thou shalt love as if your life depends on it. Listen, as we started this, this evening, there isn't a real attack on marriages. And, and it's been going on a long time. And the overwhelming majority of the time when I sit down and talk with a husband and wife, they're having issues. The overwhelming majority of the time... I can trace it back to selfishness. One or the other, or a lot of times both, are being selfish. They're, they're both just being selfish. They want their way, you know. And, and so I've been tempted just to, and I, I actually have these cards printed up, and you will not leave my office. If you come to premarital counseling, you will not leave my office without these cards, one in both hands. 
It's, it, it's just, it's like my prescription. And I'm tempted just when they walk in, say, okay, what's going on? Listen for about five minutes, hand them the card and say, do this, come back and see me later. But I'm a little bit more gracious than that. I'll spend some more time with them, listen, and, and you know, hopefully give them some tools and say, look, man, you, you, you're, you're being selfish. You're, look, you're, you're being selfish here, and you've got to make an adjustment in your heart. If you're not, this, thing's, this, this is just not going to be resolved. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We've all read this. We've all heard this so, so many times. And um, I, want, I want to read it tonight. It's the Amplified Version. And this... This is so true. You, you, we have to love as if, as if our life depends on it because the truth is it does. The life, our lives and the life of our marriage depends on our willingness to walk in this kind of love. It's 823. I'm, I'm going to wrap it up by 830, but let me, I'm going to stop real quick. Let me tell you one more story, okay? We moved to Wyoming. I'm from Louisiana. So we lived in Europe for several years. Missionaries there, we... we, we when you looked at this, this church in Laramie, and then you would have looked at it and went, John, this is not the next logical step in ministry progression. <laughs> it was like I was going backwards. But we really felt like the Lord spoke to us and told us to go there. Now, being loving the outdoors like I do and, and all those things, I mean, I was like, God, yeah, I'm in. I, I, the mountains, elk hunting, all this stuff, mountain climbing, I mean, I'm in, God. And uh, San Sandy was pretty much the same way. She, so she, she comes on in. And, and, um, so I'm out one day talking to this rancher, this we had a rancher that went to our church. Our church was, was probably, when we took the church, we had uh, about 60 people in it. And the, the church had really, really, was really in a bad shape. And one of the guys in there was a rancher, so they invited us out to eat at the, at the ranch. And, and so I'm asking, and we get out there, and just gorgeous. I know uh, Tina and Lynn have been out in that part of the country recently. It's just big and open and wide. I'm just walking around with my mouth open. Going, Man, this is just beautiful and so he's telling me about Wyoming and I said tell me about ranching and and there in in that part of the country they don't they don't measure their ranches by acres like we do here you know growing up if there was a place that had 600 acres or 1200 acres that's a pretty big place in my mind that's a pretty big place in you know Louisiana there they measure it by miles oh my ranch is about seven miles by nine miles wow and so I was asking him one day about fences I said how I mean, it's just, it'll be a huge investment putting up fences. And he said, well, we've got this law in Wyoming. It's called a fence-out law. And the law works this way. If I'm a cattle rancher and you are a sheep farmer, if I don't want your sheep on my property, I have to put up the fence to keep your sheep out, fence out. So basically what he said, if I want to protect and preserve my property from stuff coming in that would be detrimental to my property, my land, which sheep, cattle farmers don't like uh, sheep farmers because cattle eat just the top of the grass. A sheep will eat the grass, the root, and everything. The reason they call them prairie maggots, I think is what they, what they call them. That's what they call them, prairie maggots. They're, they're, not, they're not friendly, sheep and, 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 and cow ranchers, cattle ranchers. And so when he said that, I understood, yeah, you don't want sheep on your property, so you have to put this barrier in place in order to keep the sheep out, fence out. And so I got back in my, my, my truck, and I was driving back home, standing driving back home, and I was thinking about what he said. And I thought, you know, that's true in ranching, but that's also true in life. If you don't want certain things in your life, you have to get barriers in place to keep it out. Are you following me? So if you don't want selfishness in your marriage, if you don't want selfishness in your life, you have to get barriers in place to keep that selfishness out. What does that barrier look like? 1 Corinthians 13. If you've got this going on, it will kill selfishness. If you're doing it, it'll kill it. It won't give any place to it. Here's what it says. Amplified version. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious or boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us. Put your hand on your heart. Say, God's love in me. It does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account to the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. 
it does not rejoice in injustices and in, uh, in injustice and in righteousness, but it rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes and is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. It endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. You, 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 let, me, let me put it this way. If your heart ever starts getting kind of, uh, are you having a bad time? There's some conflict stuff going on. You're just kind of struggling. Are, are you, we want to resolve a conflict before you sit down with your husband or wife and you say, look, let's work this out. But before we do, let, let's let this be the barrier. Let's let this be, let's, let's get this in place before we begin. And let's make it both make a commitment that the way that we'll resolve this is according to 1 Corinthians 13. That's the way we're going to handle this. I challenge you, it'll work every single time. I've had couples that just could not resolve anything. And I said, okay, here's the deal, guys. I'm going to give you these cards. And before you sit down to resolve whatever you're working on, you read this first. And you make the commitment, we're going to do it this way. Works like a charm. Why? Because it kills selfishness. It doesn't give any place to it. 